Most instrument pilots don't understand icing. And right now I work as an air ambulance pilot flying the Pilatus PC-12 all over the Pacific Northwest. And while you may have had instrument ground school and learned about the basics of icing and where it can happen, I want to share my actual experience of what I've seen, how to avoid icing conditions and how to know where you're going to actually have too much ice for your airplane. So the first thing I want to talk about is just kind of a ground school review of icing conditions, why this matters and what we need to do about it. So icing conditions is going to be 10 degrees Celsius or less and visible moisture. That's going to be something like a cloud, rain, low visibility in flight, and 10 degrees Celsius. The reason for this is like, you know, if it's 10 degrees Celsius, then the wing, which is metal, is probably cold enough to freeze on. So we have that and we have low visibility or a cloud and we could get ice on the airframe. That's all we know, right? So if we have moisture and we have freezing temperatures, we could get ice on the airframe. Now, the thing that happens, I think, is a lot of instrument pilots don't fly in the winter at all because they're not sure where they're going to get too much ice on the plane. Now, obviously, if you're flying into known icing at all, you need to have the legal requirements for that. You need to have some de-ice um, capabilities on your aircraft. You're not taking a Cessna 172 up into the ice, or you shouldn't be, okay? Um, the hazards that come along with icing is obviously the plane is heavier and you have more drag on the airframe, but the really big one that I don't think a lot of people understand is stalling. So when does an airfoil stall? Well, you probably said the critical angle of attack, right? But a lot of people don't understand that when an airfoil is covered in ice, so when your wing or your tail is covered in ice, this is the only time that that airfoil is going to stall at a lower angle of attack than that manufacturer given critical angle of attack. So for example, in the Pilatus PC-12, we have what's called pusher safe mode. So when you have the inertial separator open and you have the prop ice de-ice on, then the AOA calculates your stall protection eight degrees down from your normal critical angle of attack. And it does this because it's saying, we don't know where the wing's gonna stall. It's gonna stall at a much lower angle of attack than normal, but we don't know exactly what it's gonna be because that depends on how much ice is on the airplane. So that's an important thing to understand. All right, so how do we know where there's going to be icing in flight? We have air mats, obviously, right? But you know that those are basically around all the time, right? So it says like from the surface up to 22,000 feet moderate icing. What does that actually mean, right? Like if it's completely clear outside VFR and there's not a cloud in the sky at your particular airport, you're not going to get any ice because there's no visible moisture. There might be freezing temperatures from the surface to whatever, but you're not going to pick up ice because there's no moisture to freeze onto the wing. So I've heard that said sometimes when I'm out at the airport with like general aviation pilots is they didn't want to go fly because they were worried about icing. Now you could get carb ice, right? Maybe, or something else, but you're not going to get external aircraft icing when there's no clouds to go into. So that's the first thing. But to go beyond that, if you're a pilot that flies an airplane that has known icing capabilities, you're like, hey, I'm gonna go fly actual IMC in the winter in a moderate icing air med. Now, some of you might have think, thought that that's insane. And others of you are just like, yeah, that's a normal Tuesday for me, okay? So what is the only way that you know what the icing conditions are going to be along your route of flight, pie reps. So pilot reports are the only way that you can for sure know what that ice accumulation is going to be like. This is something that's really important to understand. So you need to really know how to read pie reps and see how much ice is along the way. Me, for example, if I'm gonna get a call to go into Seattle in the middle of the night in the Pilatus for you know an air ambulance flight and a 737 just said that they had moderate icing on the descent from 18 to 3,000 feet, I'm probably not going to take that flight because moderate icing for a 737 is too much for a Pilatus. You know, if there's a Cessna that came through and they got light icing, we're going to be fine in that. It's not a big deal for me. So those pyreps are so important, but also being able to understand how they work and what that means for your airplane is super important. 
So I'm going to tell a little story about something that I experienced, which was really weird and had to deal with icing conditions with the Pilatus. And I think this really highlights my whole point about pyreps are super important and they're the only way that you know how to know where the icing conditions are. I was flying a flight from um, Helena to Salt Lake City. We came out of Helena, you know, super bumpy as it always is in Montana, <laughs> went over to Salt Lake. And as we're en route, um, there gets, a, there become a couple reports of pretty heavy icing going into Salt Lake. So what I can do as a pilot to um, mitigate that risk is I can spend a very short amount of time in that zone of icing. So when you're up really high, you're not going to get icing if it's super cold because the, the ice is already, you know, frozen. It's, it's not going to stick onto the plane. It's already sublimated. It's in a different chemical state. So we were up super high. We're not picking up any ice because it's really cold. But as we descend through those temperatures where it may be like negative 10, negative 12, negative five, that's where we're going to start potentially getting a lot of ice. Once we get below zero, in my experience, you're not getting any more ice. Again, that's not the legal definition. I'm just talking about what I've seen with flying. So I'm thinking about that range in flight that's like, you know, negative 18 or so to zero degrees. And if people are giving pie reps of a lot of icing in that range, I want to spend the least amount of time that I can in that zone that I could pick up ice. So I told the controller, normally in Salt Lake, they kind of step you down, you stay at a certain altitude for a while, and then you continue down. It was the middle of the night. <laughs> they did not have many people flying into Salt Lake. And I asked them, I want to get an unrestricted descent down to 7,000 feet which is where I could intercept the localizer for the ILS for runway 17 into Salt Lake. And they gave it to me, right? Because it's the middle of the night and there's really not a whole lot of traffic considerations. So instead of kind of doing a normal descent rate, I came down much faster and at a higher airspeed, which also keeps a lot of the air, the ice off the airframe. And we really didn't pick up very much ice on that flight at all. So we landed, go to Salt Lake, drop off the patient, and we are waiting to come back. Um, and there's also some pretty, you know, heavy icing reports coming out of Salt Lake. So I delayed the flight quite a bit until those reports had cleared. And I felt like it was a safe um, time to make the flight back to Idaho. And on the climb out again, you know, I asked for an unrestricted climb because if you're going to hang out at you know 5,000 or 10,000 feet, right in those icing conditions, you're really picking up a lot of ice and it's actually a lot harder to climb out of ice than it is to descend through it, right? That kind of makes sense because you're getting heavier and you're building up um, ice along the way and you're trying to climb it maybe like a slower speed than you would descend. So we did that, climbed on out, got some ice, you know, out of Salt Lake, but it wasn't anything crazy. And then coming back into, we were going to Boise, Idaho. Boise was supposed to be quite a bit of ice as well. So we're coming down um, I asked for the same thing, just wanted an unrestricted descent all the way down to where I could intercept the localizer for the ILS, did that, and we were the first ones back in that morning. So there weren't any pyrips, which is something that can be challenging in air ambulance. And um, we're just not picking up any ice, you know, we're in a moderate icing segment. Um, there, you know, was a lot of moisture on radar, which again, that really doesn't help us. It's pyrips that really help us and we're just not picking up any ice. So we told the controller, hey, I'll, like we didn't get literally any ice on the descent. And they were able to tell, you know, Alaska and Southwest who were coming in behind us, who were also saying, hey, our company told us to expect moderate icing condition. There just weren't any, right? The radar into Boise and the radar into Salt Lake looked almost the exact same with how much moisture was there. And the temperature profile was almost identical. But those pie reps, what you actually experience in flight is really the only way to know if there's actually going to be ice. So what does this mean to you if you're a general aviation pilot and you want to go out there, you have the ability maybe to be in an aircraft that has um, Fiki or has whatever it may have that allows you to legally fly in no dicing conditions and you want to experience this. Or maybe you're a new professional pilot, maybe you're SIC on something that, you know, is, is this is kind of your first like jump into icing conditions. Well, first of all, similar to when we're flying in the vicinity of thunderstorms, we need a way out. So never go into a weather condition in flight that you don't have a plan to, to leave. So for icing conditions in the summer, where's that plan to leave them? 
it's descending into warmer temperatures. In the winter, it's a lot more challenging, right? Because where is your plan to leave icing conditions? Normally it's to climb out where it's cold enough and you're not gonna be building up ice on the airframe anymore. But if you get kind of stuck climbing out and you kind of have a hard time climbing because you have so much ice, you can be in a really rough position. So think about that first thing. Second thing is look at the pie reps, right? If it's saying that there is no ice and it's the middle of the day and four or five other airplanes just came through there, you're probably good. You know, I, I think a lot of pilots think that anytime you go in the clouds with freezing temperatures, you're for sure going to get ice. And that is just not the case. So if you're looking to learn a little bit more about this and kind of stretch your experience, go with the safety pilot, go with an instructor and find a way to kind of get out there and test this a little bit, obviously legally with Fiki or whatever your known icing condition stuff is, um, and just kind of see what you find. I think you'll be interested to notice that you will not be getting ice in every cloud. And even with zero degrees in there, you're not going to be getting any ice. You could also go into another cloud where you're getting a ton of ice and there's no difference in the radar return for moisture, no difference in the satellite imagery. You're in the same air met, and that's what's really challenging about icing conditions. So if this has been helpful to you, go ahead and like and subscribe. I make a lot of content that tries to help the aviation community because I love teaching. I would be an instructor for my whole career if it paid well, but this kind of allows me to get my knowledge out to the aviation community. And hopefully if you're getting your instrument rating right now, or you're you know working on getting into a bigger plane, or maybe you have a new plane, a new job as a pilot, you want to kind of understand icing conditions more, maybe this will help you. I've had a lot of pilot friends of mine talk about certain things with flying in the winter. And I'm just like, man, they, they don't actually understand icing conditions. So maybe this video will be helpful to you. I hope that it was.